Morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. My name's Nigel, if we haven't met before. I'm one of the vicars here, and uh, it's my privilege, and I use that word not lightly, particularly given our theme today, it's my privilege to share the gospel with you, because that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the power and the beauty and the grace. We've been singing about it really, really well, I might say as well. What beautiful songs. Every single one of them about God's grace and calling us to be Uh, alive and to be aware of the wonder that once we were lost and now we are found and to go and take that message out. So we're going to talk about how church is God's mission. Are we up for that? Mm, Okay. (laughs) Sorry, we do that trick every week, don't we? It's really unfair. We're British. We don't have to shout out too much. Anyway, let's pray. God, I thank you for your gospel. What a fantastic story. Really beyond belief that you, the creator of the universe, have never stopped searching us down. We've sung about it, and we know about it. I pray that, Lord, you will restore in us the wonder that you put it in our hands. You put this story in our hands and invite us to share your purpose and your power and to be partners with you in your gospel. Help us understand and help us learn and help us be changed. Amen. Well, first of all, I want to tell you about three friends of mine. One's called Azita. I met her a few years ago. And Azita... Um, She was just where I was studying at Theological College. She was there for a week, doing a week-long course. Azita was from Iran. She'd gone to the UK, started a small business with her husband, had a small family, and uh, she never met a Christian. But one day, one night, I should say, she had a very, very vivid dream. And she dreamed that Jesus came to her and said, I'm not a God of law, I'm a God of love. And this was a long-standing dream. It just went on and on. And in that dream as well, she sort of had this picture of a red and blue shield. And then the very next day, she found herself going, as she always did every week, to the supermarket, over to Tesco's. And for the first time ever, she went in, you know, they've got those sort of lobbies as you go in in a big big Tesco extra. There was um, a little stand there and some delightful elderly ladies who were selling books. And as she walked in, one of them said, ah, and reached below and said, we were expecting someone, we didn't know who, and we want to give you this. This is the next day after her vision, and it was a Bible. And she went away and read it and had a huge impact on her. And she decided, yes, I'm going to make a commitment. I don't know what that looks like. She went to a church, and they led her on, and she came to faith. And then she ended up in Wycliffe, which happens to have a big shield as its logo, a big shield with red and blue on it. Isn't that brilliant? And then also another story, my friend Muhammad, who was actually still living in Iran at the time, also an Iranian, and he was, uh, he was there and again had a vision. No one spoke to him or shared this message that, that God was a God of love, not a God of law. And Muhammad was taken by this and shared it with his friends. And of course, that was very dangerous. And again, he had beatings. He was disciplined by the religious police in Iran. In the end, he had to flee for his life, hiding in a petrol tanker. And he got all the way out. He became an asylum seeker. He got across to to France, and they introduced him to an Iranian priest in Calais. And he gave his life to Jesus. Found himself in, in Calais, and then moved across and got into the UK. Long story short, he is now a vicar today. God rest him. Now, another story, another story is about a friend called Aptin. Similar story, except he was over in the UK, also Iranian. Now, I haven't got a thing about Iran and and kind of, don't worry, I'm not going off on one there. It's simply to illustrate that God never stops. God is the initiator of mission. And actually, there's nothing to stop God from actually reaching out. Here's my three friends here. There they are, Azita. Muhammad and Aptin. Aptin also is a student coming to faith and going into ministry. Again, I'm not making a thing about Iran. I'm not making a thing about going into ministry as if that's a high point of Christian faith. But it's just really interesting, isn't it? That they heard and they responded. God had a purpose. He responded in power and transformed them. And then he's made them partners in mission. Because this is God's missional heart. God is all about mission. If you're going to boil down the entire Bible, all its 66 books, into one metaphor, one little story, if you think about it, all 66 books come down to this one story. God is the shepherd that goes out looking. He goes out looking. He, he says, I've lost you, but I'm going to have you back. That's who God is. That's what he does. And then even from the beginning, Garden of Eden, there's God looking for Adam and Eve going, where are you? I can't find you. Why are you hiding? And all the way through to Revelation, you've got Jesus there, the lamb who was slain. 
Only he is worthy because he's gone out and sought us. There at the center of the throne was a shepherd who was also a lamb. What a great mystery that is. But it's the sign of Jesus the good shepherd going out. As Jesus, who his final words before he goes are, all power and authority is given to me, therefore go, and I will be with you always. And then he disappears. And it's that contrast, isn't it? That he's, he says, go, and he goes, and then he's actually not gone. He meets with Paul later on in Acts. All the way through Acts, Jesus keeps turning up because Jesus is missional. Jesus never leaves the mission alone. It's just really interesting, isn't it? Even, even later on when Paul's going into the big city of Corinth and going, oh, help, there's nothing going on here. It's a godless city with all kinds of idolatry going on. And God says, don't worry, I've, got, I've left people around here. And he communicates. So God is doing mission the entire time. But I also want to suggest to you that mission, sometimes we think of it as a fad, as a lunatic thing. We're Christians, we come to church, and if you really feel passionate about it, like a vegetarian or a vegan, you go out trying to change people's minds. Or maybe it's a pyramid sales scheme, you know, you want to go out and you've got the truth, you want to go and share it. Maybe the gospel is, is simply those stories, those four gospels at the beginning of the New Testament. Maybe it's the story of Christmas to Easter, the story of Jesus. But I want to suggest to you that the gospel is way, way more than that. Because you see, the gospel is actually about God and his heart to go and save. And we see that in our, in our reading today. Let's just go back through it quickly. It's about purpose, God's purpose. I wondered why Richard had given me this Bible reading, incidentally, about mission. When I would have gone for the great commission of Jesus, or else I would have gone to Romans saying, you know, who will go unless they are sent? And who will be sent unless the church sends them? All of that stuff. But Richard went for this, and I tangled over it, and I kind of muttered and thought, what's he done this for? But actually, the gospel is about purpose, power, and partnership. And it's all there. The gospel he promised beforehand... Now, the gospel didn't start on Christmas Day. The gospel started right at the very, very beginning. God was searching for us and calling us back. And through the prophets, he starts promising that he's going to get us back. It's a gospel of power. By the spirit of holiness, Jesus is appointed son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. And then as we share the gospel, it's that resurrection power in us. We are resurrected literally from the dead, from what we were, from our old selves. His power at work in us lifts us into new life. And then we're not only that, we're called to be partners. We're called into apostleship. It's not just Paul who's an apostle. Apostle is an old-fashioned word meaning sent one. It is all of us who are sent ones. We're called to be partners. And we're called to go out to the Gentiles. That's you and me, incidentally. And it's the people that led us to faith normally, unless anyone happened to meet, meet a Messianic Jew who, who may have had the gospel too. But mostly we are the Gentiles who are reaching out to more Gentiles. So there's purpose in God's plans, there's power in God's plans, and there's partnership in God's plans. Let's just unpick that a little bit more. First of all, he's purposely, purposefully pursuing mankind from the start. And let me, let me tell you this, don't take it the wrong way. God doesn't actually need your help. He actually doesn't need your help. Can you see all the stuff he's been doing through, pre, you know, from eternity to the present day on this little timeline we get to walk on? God is outside of all that, and he doesn't actually need our help. But this is what he does. This is who he is. Look at my Iranian friends. They actually didn't need, they were exceptional in a way because they, it was God reaching to them directly. Look at many of our own testimonies. And we may have, some of us do, some of us don't have people that we can testify, they led us to Jesus. Some of us have testimonies where, you know what, I just wandered in here one day because God was calling me. I don't know how, but as I look back, I realize God did that. So God is at work the whole time. And God's loving, guiding hand is over it. God has a purpose in his gospel. And each of us here has responded to that purpose. But more than that, God's gospel is powerful. It transforms it changes people. Some of us, most of us here, as I look around, probably don't have those kinds of testimonies that put you up on a platform and you, you say something amazing's happened. Some of you do, but most of us, I quite like the ordinary testimonies because they're a bit like mine. And yet, it's a miracle. Don't underestimate the fact that once you were lost and now you were found, that's one heck of a testimony. And it's to do with God's power that you can testify to who he is and what he does in your life. So it's powerful. 
And as I've said already, the resurrection power is talk- that Paul is talking about here isn't just about the resurrection of Jesus, but the, the resurrection that we get drawn into as our sins are forgiven and we say, okay, now longer, it's, no longer is it me that lives, but Christ who lives in me. I surrender to Jesus as Lord and Master. That's resurrection power as well. So it's powerful. Thirdly, although God doesn't need you, listen to this. And we wouldn't dare say it, actually, if it wasn't written in the Bible quite clearly. How could Almighty God, our Creator, the author of the entire universe, the one who has put everything in in place, every atom, every molecule, every living creature, every breath of every living thing, every cell in every tree, every star in space. How could I say that I'm a partner? It would be blasphemous. It would be a crazy thing to say, except that it's true. That God looks at me and goes, yep, I don't need your help, but actually I've given you a new identity, which means whether you like it or not, you are my partner. And again, this isn't something which is like a lifestyle choice. It's not something that we go, well, you know, I'm going to go and help out in the food bank every now and then. That's a good thing. And it's not a case of, well, I'm going to help out in girls' brigade every now and then. That's a good thing. It's not something we switch on and we switch off. It is our long-held, eternal, and lasting identity. It's something we get called in to do. Let's just look at that sense of partnership. There's this word that's used throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, which is koinonia. It's a Greek word. And we often translate it as fellowship, because that's a nice Christian-sounding word. And unless you're an academic, you don't really know what the word fellowship is. So we hide behind this word, but really fellowship is another word for partnership. And we kind of lose some of the sense of translation of this koinonia word. But if you're in any doubt that we're not called to be partners, and that actually it's just not part of our identity, here's three good verses. First of all, We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you also may have partnership with us. And our partnership is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Or Paul talking to the Corinthians, God is faithful. He's called you into partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Peter this time, Jesus' leader, his, his head disciple. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may have partnership in the divine nature. Do you see, it sounds almost blasphemous. How arrogant of us to say we're partners with God, except that God tells us that. It's an incredible thing. It's mind-blowing. So church is God's mission agency. We're partners individually, but even more so, how feeble we might be unless we could join together with people of other gifts, other backgrounds, other strengths, People to inspire us and encourage us and strengthen us. People that we can also inspire and encourage and strengthen. The church is this beautiful idea God has to say, I'm not only partners with you as individuals, I'm calling you all to partner as one giant team. And if you're large enough, one giant army as well. And God does this with churches. I was having a conversation a few weeks ago up in Southwark um, where some people were talking about how they were applying for a grant because I'm back on the theme of Iranians again. Again, I'm just demonstrating that as one single nation, God is is just restless and going on and on and on. You could have this story, I have no doubt, about every single nation in the world. I talked about someone who was telling me similar stories about North Korea. I know it's probably happening even in Russia. But I'm just keeping coming back on the theme of Iran because I just happened again to come across these people as I had a meeting in Southwark. They said that they just realized in their church for some reason God was calling in Iranians, not just immigrants and refugees who were coming in, but professionals, people with small businesses. They just all happened to alight on that one church. And so they were going to Southwark saying, please, we need some money and we're going to start drawing these people together and having a dedicated Iranian church. This photograph here is my friend Muhammad, you can probably see him again in the middle there, who is working in an Iranian church in Liverpool Cathedral. Just brilliant, isn't it? That God is just working again and again. You multiply that out by every nation on the earth and you just see what God is doing. And he does this not only through us as individuals, but as a church. God, church is God's mission angel, agency. We're carrying on his purposes We're holding his power and sharing the power that we too have been transformed by, and we partner with him. I heard an amazing story a couple of years ago as well. If you think you need to have special skills and go to theological college and even have a degree of any kind, a brilliant story 
about this guy. Um, he was the principal of a, um, of a theological college in India. And this young man came along one day and, uh, and said, can I come to your college? And he said, sure. Um, what qualifications have you got? And the guy said, well, I haven't got any because I can't read. And he said, oh, that's going to be a hindrance in a theological college. But I'll tell you what, come along, listen to these lectures and uh, see what you think. So the man went along there and listened carefully for two years. And he came to graduation, and he said, well, I'm ready to graduate. And the principal had to say, well, I'm sorry, but you've not done any exams. You can't graduate. And so that was okay. That was agreed, and away they went. And one day, this principal met that young man, two or three years later. Maybe it was five. And he said, hey, how's it going? What have you been doing? And, you know, I always wonder what happened to you. And he said, oh, not bad. I've, I've planted about 10 to 15 churches in the different rural areas around India. And of course, it begs the question, um, how did he do that when he couldn't even read? And apparently what he did was he would just sit down before a church service, and his daughter, who could read, would read out the gospel reading or the Bible reading, and he'd sit there and go, Lord, please tell me what you want to say today. Okay. And he'd go and preach the gospel, and he built church after church. So it is not a specialist activity. It's for anyone, and there is no boundary to what is possible when you do that. My son Gideon goes to a church. Um, you, many of you know my son. Um, he's now down in Exeter working in this church. But they have this philosophy where they get to the number of about 150 people. And they go, well, that's a bit too many. So they say, well, we're going to take 30 people. We're going to equip them and encourage them and resource them and bless them. And we're going to send them out. The last time I went to visit his church, they were having a, a restore the core session because they'd given away about 20% of their number in the church to start a new church. On this occasion, it was called St. Basil's, and it met in a barn, and it specialized in targeting farmers. And apparently, God is doing great work in East Devon among farmers. Isn't that brilliant? And again and again, this is the story of that particular church, Exeter, Exeter Network Church. And I'm really challenged by that. I think that's absolutely fantastic. So let's now turn our thoughts to St. Mary's as God's mission agency here in Rygate and Red Hill and wherever you may be drawn from. Well, there's lots to give thanks for. Let's face it. We're bucking the trend in terms of what we read and hear and know about the church across the nation. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord that in this retreat for a year, what were they? Fives and sixes, they went off to Carity Wood, which is a lovely kind of uh, retreat center for kids and stuff, around 10 kids, maybe more than that, made a commitment to give their lives to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's fantastic. 15 to 20 kids went to the Satellites Festival in the summer and made a commitment. God's working on them, talking to them, speaking, drawing them in. It's purpose, power, and partnership with the people that are sharing the gospel with them. But then we have new joiners all the time. I oversee the life groups, and it's a joy. I've had a conversation with someone. I don't know if you're here today, because I'm not sure I've actually met you yet. But you said, can I join a life group? And I said, well, there's, mm, I don't know if there's space for where you, where you need to be. But I tell you what, let's start a new one. Isn't that amazing? When we had the baptisms the other night, three of those people, I believe at least three, had been on the recent Alpha course. So God is alive and working in, with, with purpose, with power, and in partnership with St. Mary's. It's all the same hallmarks. And let's go back to that church planting idea now. Let's look at something that's really encouraging. This is another story about St. Mary's. There we go, success for new church. Some of the old people, who remembers this in the church? God bless you. I'm seeing some hands here. This was St. Mary's 30 years ago. And if you look very carefully, Right in the center, with the, with the darker kind of top on, between, in that sort of second row, you'll recognize our very own Mike Fox that was giving the prayers here. Isn't that brilliant? That St. Mary's, and it's 50 adults and around 20 kids, were called, equipped and trained and prayed for. Isn't that a fantastic story? I know you're all sort of looking, going, oh, I recognize them. Look at some of the names of the Bowens here today. Yes, there's just one today, but I know, isn't that fantastic? This is something we did, but friends, it was 30 years ago. It's no doubt it's really encouraging. I just want to look at it a bit more. Go on, Kate, let's have another one. This is a letter I dug out. Mike was showing me some of the paperwork. This is a letter from uh, someone I heard called Richard I, Richard Thompson, who was a vicar here about 30 years ago. Richard I, and he's writing to Mike, and he's saying this, thank you very much for your letter and list just received. I'm absolutely thrilled that you're taking this great step of faith. The Priory Congregation, that's what they were called because they went down to the Priory School, are going to leave this Sunday morning after the first 30 minutes. 
I love this bit. Obviously, they'll need to leave their cars parked somewhere, otherwise they'll be blocked in until 11.30. Or a letter from the area dean. This is the person who kind of oversees the cluster of churches. And again, some of the things he says, it's an immense encouragement to see a church community prepared to be forward-looking and at least a little adventurous and to take Christ's invitation seriously to go. We so often seem to be expecting people to come to us. Isn't that exciting? That was a, something that happened here at St. Mary's. But friends, I'm sure you've realized now, you saw Mike just now, and you know, he's not getting any younger. That was 30 years ago. No offense, Mike, but it's time we started doing more of that. I think Mike's done enough, don't you? So perhaps it's time we start to think radically, what is God's purpose? How can I use God's power? And how can I partner with God? And the overall upshot, it's a great story. Some people have drifted back into St. Mary's. God bless them. They're most welcome. They actually went on from priory school. They went and formed a, um, uh, a, they tried to join with a church called St. Peter's. And ultimately, their combined forces went over to St. Luke's church over in Sandcross, which was struggling at that time. Here's a photograph from about two or three weeks ago where they were licensing in the new vicar. St. Luke's is thriving. God bless them. They're a great church. But just in case you're in any doubt, don't take any credit for that, St. Mary's, because it was God who did that. Can you see? God inspired. God, God gave that message to people and partnered with people in St. Mary's to go on that journey, not knowing where they were going, and ultimately to find themselves there. And when you go to St. Luke's, there's many people there that track themselves back to St. Mary's. But that's where God has sent them on now. So it's time to stop being nostalgic because that was in the past, and it's really encouraging, but we can't really take any credit for that. It's time to stop being nostalgic and look forward and say, well, what are the ways in we can do things? We're doing all this great stuff as a church, but are there even more radical ways that we can do stuff? I simply ask you this, are there additional ways we could partner with God as his mission agency? What could we be doing? How can we raise our sights? Because we do great stuff. I'm not knocking you. I'm not being critical but I am inspired, and I do know this, that the world really, really needs the church. And if we're resourced and populated and talented the way we are, I believe we actually have an obligation to do all that we can, to share, to encourage, to reach, to invite, and also to strengthen those brothers and sisters in other churches, perhaps, who may be needing that encouragement and strengthening. Could we be doing more than simply expecting people to come? Could we be exploring how we could pray into God's purpose, God's power to intervene in life and to change lives? Could we be doing more to live up to our calling and identity so that, so that partnership isn't just a, a choice for the lunatic fringe, but it's what we take on board and think, whoever I am, whatever gifts, background, connections, neighbors, friends, family I have, I can do that bit of partnering in the gospel. I want to close with a final letter around the church plant that Mike shared with me. And it's from the Bishop of, uh, of Croydon, our local bishop, um, called Bishop Wilfred. He's not here anymore. That was 30 years ago, if you haven't had the message. And again, it's really encouraging. And I'm sorry, I've, I've kind of spoken for 20 minutes, and all I had to do was really show you this letter, because it's all in this. I guess it would be, because he's a bishop, and he's more brilliant than I am. So he says this, and I'm summarizing. Well, in fact, that's that, that's that second paragraph. One of, the mo mo one of the many captivating images of God we find in Jesus Christ is of a loving Father who is forever reaching out. He treasures the long-serving faithful Son, and he rushes out to meet the returning prodigal. He values the 99 highly, and he goes out to find the missing lamb. There is a restlessness about the love of God that locks that love onto those who appear to find it in their who appear not to find it in their own lives or unable to recognize its presence in their lives and as our lives are flooded with this love so we are swept away along by it towards those he loves and wishes to embrace that's it that's mission read it again it's great God has a purpose for the gospel. 
He has a purpose for it to be heard in every home in this town. God has power. He does the work. Don't worry. It's not about your skills or gifts. God has power, and he has done great things, and he will do great things. Be confident of that. And God is a God of partnership. He has made us to join in with the Lord of the harvest. He wants to bring his purpose and power to our town, to our neighbours, and everyone that he puts us in touch with.